I, I hope all of you have seen the film by now. Uh, if you haven't, I don't know what's wrong, get going as soon as we're done here. Um, this is a film that was many, many years in the making and tracks um, a, a, a relationship and the arc of an organization and a movement really over, over four decades. And it began uh, with, uh, with a handful of young people uh, beginning an organization dedicated to making health a right, not a privilege. And, uh, and of course became uh, so much more uh, in the in the decades that followed, and uh, and the story of of uh, of these individuals and of partners in health is is told obviously really really movingly, um, but the film is so much more than that. Uh, since its release in 2017 at the Sundance Film Festival, it's had a great critical reception. Uh, but you know, I always say this film is not about partners in health. This film is about the movement for global health equity, and it's an amazing story of how change happens and, and change happens through solidarity and collaboration and compassion as much as it does hard work and good ideas and, and power comes from unlikely places. And in a time of pandemic, I think this is the most important film in the world right now. And so we're really thrilled that Netflix finally came to their senses and, uh, and is helping to share it with the, the world. And I hope you all tell everybody you know to, to see the film if they haven't already. Um, I'll stop there. For those who don't know me, I worked with, have worked with Partners in Health for nearly two decades now and in many capacities, um, especially in Rwanda, and helped to start University of Global Health Equity uh, once upon a time, now based here in Oxford. So this feels like a great homecoming for me. Uh, the film Bending the Arc is certified, 100% certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, not 99%, but 100%. And our guests today are also 100% certified fresh and I'm uh, excited to introduce them. We'll skip over most of the biography because I could spend an hour talking about their accomplishments. I'll do a brief introduction and just ask each one of you to tell us where you are and how you're feeling right now existentially in a word. Um, so let's start with Ophelia Dahl. Ophelia is one of the co-founders of Partners in Health. She is uh, in and narrates the film and was executive director of Partners in Health for an astonishing period of time. What a feat of endurance. I think it was 16 years. And she, of course, remains uh, chair of the, uh, of the board of Partners in Health. Ophelia, great to see you. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. I'm in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I'm feeling hopeful. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Jim Young Kim. Uh, great to see you, Jim. Jim, of course, is also one of the co-founders of Partners in Health, physician, uh, anthropologist, uh, ran the AIDS program at the World Health Organization, ran the World Bank, has, has done many, many things, is currently uh, vice president at uh, Global Infrastructure Partners. Uh, Jim, great to see you. Uh, where are you joining us from tonight? Good to see you, Peter. I'm in Westchester County. I'm in Rye, New York. And how are you feeling in a word? Uh, worried. Uh, we have a, some, an event coming up in a, in a week and, you know, I, I feel like uh, literally the fate of the world is, uh, is resting on it. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, there's, um, I, I can't remember uh, any event in my lifetime more than the last hundred years that I think is more important uh, for, you know, the future, um, especially of poor people um, suffering from, from, uh, from poor health. But, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm just, just frankly very worried. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, thank you. Um, for all of you uh, Americans out there, if you haven't voted, what are you waiting for? Please go vote. Uh, next is Dr. Paul Farmer. Um, Paul, co-founder of Partners in Health, physician, anthropologist, certified 100% global health rock star. Um, Paul, nice to see you, welcome. Thanks, Peter. I'm in Miami. And uh, uh, just to integrate the comments from my two pals, I'm feeling uh, hope suffused by anxiety. So, <laughs> Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, hello, Joya. Um, I haven't seen you for hours, so it's great to be together again. Dr. Joya Mukherjee, uh, infectious disease doctor, pediatrician, social justice activist, singer, songwriter, and chief medical officer of Partners in Health. Hello, Joya. Hi, Peter. Um, and I'm in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, and I am just feeling very, very hungry for change. Amen. Thank you and welcome. 
And last but not least, uh, fearless leader, vice chancellor of the University of Global Health, uh, equity, former minister of health of uh, Rwanda, amongst many other roles uh, in uh, the government in that extraordinary country, uh, I think joining from her home. Welcome, Dr. Agnes. Hello, Peter. Hello, my dear friend. Bisous Mwah. through internet to all of you. A COVID mode because we cannot touch each other, <laughs> but we are together. I'm in Rwanda. And uh, I want just to say that whatever place you are, global health fighters, where you have your two feet is the center of the world. Mm. So happy to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, and yes. And again, welcome everyone. Let's um, kick things off. So what we're gonna do is uh, um, go around, ask some questions. I wanna talk a little bit about the some of the themes from the film. Of course, we'll bring it to uh, the current moment and why I think this film is more instructive than, than ever in this time of, uh, of, of transformation. And, um, and then we'll look to the future and to the role that University of Global Health Equity can play in building the kind of future that we need and, and we want. Um, so I'll go around, ask a couple of questions. And since we haven't done much preparation, you know, keep your answers to about two minutes and then we'll have a little bit of time after a, a, a couple of questions for others to jump in. Let's make it loose and, and, and conversational. Uh, Ophelia, I'm gonna start with you. Um, because you begin and end the film. And, and of course the film kicks off with the story of how you uh, met Paul and all of you came together and started Partners in Health and, and, and finishes with this you know, really moving statement that um, when you get right down to it, this is all about love. Um, and at the, the, the golden thread through this film is friendship and love and compassion. And I wonder if you can reflect on these relationships and, um, and, and why that and solidarity is so important in this kind of work. You're on mute. I, I think that friendship is obviously very important in this. And, and um, as I've reflected on this, there's no question that the friendship comes first. Um, you know, I think that's true of all of us. Um, Jim and, and Paul and uh, Tom White all met in the same year. We all came from entirely different experiences, different countries, um, you know, initially for Jim um, and for me and different backgrounds. We were obviously all privileged in our different ways. And I'm not sure if it's fluky. I know Jim doesn't think that, that, that you know, luck is is plays a, a big role in this because I think that we were all drawn to places and to work that we might not have gone um, if we weren't interested in the way the world worked and um, dissatisfied with the way things were um, working uh, and supposed to be. I think we were also drawn together because of something um, unknowable like chemistry um, but also we recognized in each other and this is important as we grew um, and met other friends in this work is that we recognize in each other a sensibility, a way of looking at the world and its myriad complexities. And, um, and we had, I think, all of us a sort of prag pragmatism born of our own ideas, our own backgrounds, our own opportunities and that sort of thing. And I think that that is the stuff that you need to be able to do difficult work together, uphill work. There was trust. And as you said, of course, there was love. Um, and I think that there was, um, is also humor. And I can't underline that enough that there, I know Joya mentions it in the film, but really we, we went through some very, very dark times um, and, and I'm sure we'll do um, together. So, you know, this, these, those kinds of characteristics were a constant as we grew. So Joya and Agnes and you, Peter, Loon, um, Corey Shepard Stern, for example, who, um, made this film and who engaged in some very complex, uh, long drawn out work to do this. That, that, um, that ability to work together and recognize something in each other um, has been very important, that friendship. Mm. Thank you. Jim, I want to pick up on that, that sort of golden thread that I think runs through all of your, your lives and careers. You mentioned in the film that there was a time when, after all these years of sort of working from the outside to shake up the system, 
suddenly you were inside the tent. And I think you represent that more than probably anyone, of course, because of some of the roles that you went on to play, you know, not least as president of the, the World Bank Group. And I remember I was with Paul in Kigali when I think Tim Geithner called him the week that all of that went down. And I, I just, I couldn't believe it not because you weren't the perfect person, but in some ways you were such an unlikely person to take on that role. When you were kind of on the inside in roles like that, what was the role of these relationships, of your connection to and the values of Partners in Health in um, you know, guiding you through some of that work? Well, you know, Peter, it was pretty explicit. You know, the preferential option for the poor, we adopted as a goal, you know, ending poverty by 2030. And, uh, uh, you know, um, I, I was in touch with lots of people at PIH through the entire time, you know, show up at meetings and see Joya and, and you know, Pell was at the, at the Pell, excuse me, Paul, uh, uh, the, the, you know, he was at the, he was at the bank all the time. And, uh, you know, things started at the bank um, because of Partners in Health. So for example, on Ebola, Right, um, uh, I was watching it, but you know the World Bank usually plays no role in uh, in epidemics, and so I just finally called. Uh, um, I'll call you. I'll call him. Just no, we all call him Paul Pell. Okay, so I I called Pell and I said, "What is going on?" And he said, "He said, well, you know, so I'm here in Liberia, and I've just never seen this much virus in the communities. I don't know when how we can stop this. This, this could be with us." Forever, this if this goes to Delhi, if this goes to Karachi, I just don't know what we're going to do. And and so you know, I thought, well, surely there must be somebody out there working on this. And so it was that phone call that got me moving, and uh, we approved uh, you know four hundred million dollars for Ebola, which was the first. It was the first declaration of sort of commitment of anybody, and then soon after, the U.S. stepped up, and then others. But there was really nothing going on for eight months. And so I, you know, again, it comes up in the film. We, I, I was late, you know, I, I'm, you know, we were all late again. And, and uh, you know, the people from those three countries will tell you, well, it's because we're the Mono River people. And nobody cares about, even in Africa, nobody cares about the Mono River people, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, you know, everything from the very fundamental goal of ending poverty by 2030, to responses to cholera. We worked together on cholera in Haiti. We, we um, uh, worked together on Ebola, it never ended. And so I, I, you know, I hope my, my, my friends on this call will agree. It never felt to me like I'd left Partners in Health and gone to another institution. It felt to me like I was bringing Partners in Health to the institution. I think the focus on poverty came, became much more intense. I think, uh, you know, the focus on, uh, um, uh, you know, tr especially toward the end on health and education. I mean, we, we created this uh, human capital index because I wanted to hold, um, you know, leaders of countries responsible. And so now we have an index that tells people every two years now how they're doing on health and education. And it's been very interesting because uh, the thing that I worried about was I would go to meeting after meeting where heads of state and ministers of finance would wax poetic about how much they cared about health. But in, in most places, unlike Rwanda, in most places, they weren't doing anything. You know, in Nigeria, the, the leaders were just going on and on about how committed they were to health. And they were spending 0.7% of GDP on health. And almost all of that was, was uh, low interest loans from the World Bank. So, you know, we, we held them accountable because it's not, you know, um, I, I think so much of the global health movement was getting rich countries to donate to poor countries. But one of the things I learned is that um, um, uh, so many leaders uh, say, oh, yes, yes, we need the donations, and they do. But then as soon as the donations come in, they replace that money and then put money into something else, like building armies in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we um, uh, uh, you know, that was the last thing I did at, part, at, uh, at, at, uh, at the World Bank Group. And then it's just been fantastic. Uh, getting back in 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 the fold and uh, you know working at Partners Now I, and, and I just feel like um, it, it might have felt like a long time for 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 some, but it feels like I was just gone for a little while and I'm now back in the fold. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. And, you know, and yes, I've heard you say in recent months that a pandemic is 
is just an epidemic managed badly. And I think, uh, you know, Ebola is a, is a reminder of that. And speaking of which, as we uh, move to Paul, um, I'm just gonna make a shameless promotion on your behalf. For those who don't know, Paul has a, a new book coming out in just a couple of weeks, uh, Fever, Feuds and Diamonds. Um, Ebola and the Ravages of History. Yes, I have taken a photocopy of the cover and pasted it to a Haruki Murakami novel because you haven't sent me a copy yet. Um, but I've read most of it in early forms. Um, it's a book about how, um, uh, you know, how inequality can fuel the global spread of a deadly virus. I can't imagine what relevance it possibly has in, in 2020. Um, but you should read it anyways. Paul, you... Here. You put the P in partners in health, right? What you taught me on my first day and all of us every day since is that partnerships are at the heart of this work. And you know, the pandemic teaches us that we're all in this together, whether we like it or not, that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And while it feels like sometimes, you know, we're getting ripped apart or moving from globalization to, to regionalism, you know, to get through this, we have to pull together. Can you reflect on um, you know, the importance of partnerships now more than ever? Well, you know, I think I think uh, one of the things that um, we see is for a lot of people involved in this work, and again, I'm just speaking as someone who's worked largely with partners in health, but it's the same with other organizations. This is a constant, a chronic, a daily engagement, and uh, and and the contours of the debates are not clear to a lot of people. They're not deeply involved in it or they're shielded from the kind of risks that um, the people we're serving are not. And then once in a while, something happens that rips away the veil, right? And that may be uh, a, a conflict or a war or, or a pandemic. In this case, uh, a pandemic and, and you know, the murder of a number of African-Americans uh, in the United States, again, uh, against a backdrop of steady uh, abuses, but now uh, entirely visible to a lot of people. And so, you know, so it is with partnership, you know, any illusion that you cannot, that you're going to be able to do things by yourself, make a big difference on a systemic issue, whether that be systemic racism or lack of access to a reliable publicly funded healthcare system. These are times in which these illusions are revealed as such. And, um, and I think partnership really can uh, belong way up there at the top of that list. Um, collaboration, solidarity, partnership, pragmatic solidarity. Uh, it's just hard to imagine any of the uh, victories that we've described um, or that we've known rather, uh, many of them undescribed. It's hard to imagine those victories would be possible without partnership. And uh, you know that's why Jim was effective in the various roles that he embrace whether at the World Health Organization or Dartmouth or World Bank. That's why Ophelia was effective as a, uh, a leadership, as, as the leader of a very large organization that's really a constellation of organizations. It's because they're true believers in partnership and in understanding the limitations of their own engagement. And I think, uh, you know, I think that that uh, mother's milk of partnership at the heart of Partners in Health has been revealed again and again for anybody willing to work over the years. Uh, you knew this when you were director of Partners in Health Rwanda, that you know, you couldn't meet any major goal without it. And uh, I, I, I feel like we're sitting pretty right now in the sense of uh, this being a widespread or more widely appreciated that you need partnership to get things done. Mm. Thank you, Paul. And this is obviously conveyed so so beautifully in the in the film. And if you think about the way the world changed, you know, for example, from one in which um, you know, HIV was a death sentence for most everyone who was infected, despite the, uh, you know, the existence of effective treatment to one in which everyone who had AIDS had at least a shot at treatment over a period of time. It wasn't uh, it wasn't only a few people. It wasn't one organization that did it. It took those who were disrupting the status quo and showing models for change as all of you did, but it took 
uh, it took a social movement, it took activism, it took um, you know, political will from leaders like Paul Kagame and George Bush, it took smart people to uh, recognize market failures and figure all that stuff out. And um, it, it, it just worth, I think, taking a moment to recognize Corey Stern, who is um, out there in the audience this evening, the producer of the film. And you know, tonight we have the visionaries behind the work um, you know, with us, but Corey's really the visionary behind the, the, the film. And it always upsets me because she teaches more in an hour and 40 one minutes than I did in a semester about this stuff. Um, Joy, I, I want to move on to you. Bravo, as Jim said. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Bravo, Corey. Joy, we spoke earlier today uh, about the pandemic uh, that, of course, we're all currently living through and working hard to, to try to you know, turn, turn the tide on. And uh, you, of course, um, have such an interesting perspective on this from your work, both domestically in the U.S. and in, in so many places around the world, and are one of the people who have been spearheading this partnership with the state of Massachusetts um, to help to strengthen contact tracing. Um, and I want you to just talk a little bit about that and how some of the lessons from our work and from our colleagues in Haiti, Rwanda, and elsewhere have actually kind of informed um, that work and, um, and, and, and I guess just some of the surprising failures of, uh, you know, of, of how this has all played out in, in places like the U.S. Great. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, and, you know, want to give a huge thanks to Jim, who really opened that door for us with Governor Baker. Um, no, we uh, were humbled by the incredible success of Rwanda. And I know that Dr. Benaguaho will talk about that and around the world that health systems were responding, leadership was responding. And what we've seen in the United States is not only an epic failure of leadership, which I think has been well discussed and will be discussed for many generations to come, but also the fact that we do not have a system. We don't have a health system. Um, and yet uh, in the United States, we have great medical care. We have world-class hospitals. We were trained there and grateful for that excellent training, but there's no connection, ostensibly no connection between communities, health centers and hospitals. There's no referral, counter-referral, uh, you know, to put it in the medical term, but there's no real sense of a network. And I think for me, as a person who had done the majority of my work around the world, that realization was incredibly dispiriting and, and hard. And so, you know, with the Governor Baker, who showed tremendous leadership in saying, let's do everything we can, and, you know, Jim's leadership to say, you know, let's think about using Partners in Health. What we did was basically the same thing we had done with Dr. Agnes in Rwanda and with our colleagues in Sierra Leone and Liberia and over many years in Haiti, which is harness the power of community, support the public sector, and really look at the social forces poverty, lack of food, housing, et cetera, to address this epidemic. Those three things, right? And so our public sector accompaniment was, is, still is with the Department of Public Health, the local boards of health. They are terrific. They're wildly underfunded and they could not keep up with demand. So we created a system that was basically a pop-off valve for additional cases as the surge came and went and came back again. And working with, very closely with, um, you know, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, the local boards of health, the governor's office, uh, you know, the people in the governor's office. So that public sector accompaniment, we learned that around the world. Um, and then secondly, this attention to the vulnerable, the idea that nobody can quarantine, can isolate without the material resources they need to do so. And we created a cadre we call the care resource coordinators who are essentially economic and social accompanators that help the vulnerable. And our CRCs, as we call them, have provided baby formula, groceries, worked with healthcare for the homeless, provide housing. Um, 
and you know worked with people who are undocumented to make sure that they have the legal support they need. I mean, those what we sometimes call wraparound services to us as social medicine practitioners are so critical. And then this connection, connection between healthcare, hospital, community. We worked with the community health centers, which were neglected, abused, um, oppressed, and 25% of the contact tracers that we hired were from community health centers so that we could build this capability within the community health centers. And there's a lot more to all of it. But I think when we think about it, and we've been now invited to help in cities and states all over the country. Um, and the greatest thing is that many of you uh, who are calling in, this is the team because we have pulled in experts from Haiti. We have pulled in experts from Sierra Leone, from Liberia, from Malawi. Um, and just as we did, um, during the earthquake, just as we did with Ebola, we had a basically an all points bulletin for people who had trained in this system of equity and justice to come forward and help with this pandemic in this epicenter, which happens to be in the, the US. Um, and meanwhile, you know, our, our country teams are working hard and, you know, in Kono district, there's only been one case in the last two weeks. Uh, again, that, and that's in Sierra Leone. So these are solvable problems, but it takes this kind of solidarity and deep commitment and really an approach that directly addresses racism, oppression, poverty, vulnerability, not as an aside, but as the heart of the approach. Mm, thank you. I want to turn to on yes, and then we'll, we'll open it up to others to, um, to, to comment. Um, Agnes, let's talk about Rwanda. Uh, in contrast to, for example, what we're experiencing in the US, which is a, a, a complete failure on so many levels and despite all the resources we've seen now, 9 million cases documented, many millions undocumented, uh, 226,000 deaths in, 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 in counting. Um, you know, Rwanda in contrast, 5,000 cases and I think 34 deaths at, at last count, at least to, to my knowledge. I remember very early on, um, of course, I was following the news in Rwanda closely as I do early on in the pandemic, um, reading about the way that the government through community health workers was distributing food packets to vulnerable families in anticipation of the lockdown. To Joya's point earlier about this need for support of the most vulnerable through a time of shared sacrifice. And I said to myself, this is gonna to be tough, but they got this. And, and I think that's been the case. Can you just talk a little bit about um, what has been happening in Rwanda and why the country has been able relatively well to weather the storm thus far? Uh, thank you, Peter, and hello, everybody. And uh, I want to make the link with what we see in the film and what we are doing now to fight COVID. And uh, what is show, what, what the film show us is that we have learned in Rwanda to take decision evidence-based. Mm -hmm. And we have understand that we need to invest in human development. We are not rich, that's true. But what we do, we try, we do our best. Everybody do its best to leave no one out. Is exactly what uh, Joya and Paul were saying. It is important to the, for the development of the country to leave no one out. So uh, since 25 years after the genocide, we have built a health sector purposely based on equity. Of course, we cannot have all the services, but what we have, we try to share equitably with everybody, creating a system that make health service affordable through a community health insurance, make the service accessible through a true decentralization and have community health workers in all village. A village is 200 houses uh, um, roughly. And doing so, asking the people to participate in their own health by electing the community health workers for now in each village, people have trust. And we have built on that to the response of COVID. Community health workers were well known. 
selected by the people, having the trust of the people, they explain what was going on. When we didn't know, they explain, we don't know this. When we change, the world change and decide to have a mask, they were on the front line to explain why we need a mask because we have new knowledge. The, we, we have a system that made the healthcare affordable. It's not completely finished. But for this pandemic, what we did, we are sure that each and every one could be tested for free. It was not easy. Hmm. But nobody went, asked a test, and we explain I can be infected and be left out. All the care were free. No one pay even for intensive care. So by creating a system like that, we all the population came supporting the effort and that's how we make it. Using science, when the science change, we change the protocol, no problem. In, we teach people at all level, doctors, nurses, community health workers, and the community, what is going on, why we are doing this now, and why we change. And by creating this trust, this type of information, following the science, evidence-based, and having a homegrown solution when we didn't know uh, how to do, learn how to do, we had the compliance of the population, and that's how today we have less than 5,100 5, cases and less than 40 deaths. Yeah. It's because of the population. Yeah. It's because the way we have created trust. It's because we leave no one out. It's because we make things up for the hmm. yeah. Remarkable. And uh, someone just... agrees with you out there on yes. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Not... Right. That's it's right. not my dog. It's Mark, my tea. Be quiet. <laughs> well, can, can, can I jump in? Please, Jim. So, uh, you know, what we just heard uh, from Agnes is just so remarkable. And it's so remarkable given the experience we've had here in the United States. You know, Joy and I, um, first of all, it's, it's been so great to get back together and work on stuff. And, and so for Joy and I to get to work on Massachusetts, it's just been, it's been so wonderful. But, you know, we were in the middle of arguments um, and look, I, I think this story has to be told that Joy and I came in and said, look, you, you, cannot, you cannot take shortcuts. We have to put together a system that does what we learned from Jon Snow with the damn, you know, uh, uh, water hand, the water pump handle. You have to do uh, testing and contact tracing and isolation and quarantine. And you have to support people during that process. And very well-known public health officials you know, in a conversation that Joy and I participated and said, no, it's too late. You can't do it. It's too difficult. So to the list of issues that, you know, the, the list of character traits of partners in health, I would add courage. Mm -hmm. you know, these guys were afraid and that it would be too difficult. And you, you'll re you guys remember the, 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 what we used to say about HIV treatment, right? Uh, what did people say when we said HIV treatment in Africa? Well, I, you know, let me just say, Agnes yelled at me when, uh, when we first put the three by five target out there. But Agnes yelled at me because she said, how can you set a target like that and not give us any resources? But that's not what everyone else was saying. What everyone else was saying is it's too hard. It's too complicated. We can't do it. And, and uh, uh, very prominent people were willing to write off an entire continent because they thought HIV treatment was too difficult. I mean, some of the most prominent people in the world we're saying it's impossible. And we were saying, how can you possibly write off 25 million people living with HIV in Africa? But that's exactly what they did. And I couldn't believe that we were basically making the same error in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Joy and I would like get into it with these guys. What do you mean it's too late? Uh, well, there are too many cases. Okay, but then uh, there, you, you've got to start now, build up the capacity and then, you know, uh, hope to God the cases come down. And when they do, then you'll be able to chase down every outbreak. Uh, oh, no, it's too late. There's no role. And they didn't know what they were talking about. And they were more excited about, you know, seeing their own ideas. And in this case, it was herd immunity 
sort of get played out. Wow, wouldn't it be interesting if we just let it go? And there was- And now you know, they're denying that. You know, now they're all denying that they said that. But it's, it's, it's written. It's written. I mean, they wrote it in papers. They did interviews. It's all there, right? It's, uh, you, you are the country of alternative facts, huh? Well, no, alternative so, facts. so, you know, I just want to say, I just want to say the thing that used to drive, you know, when, when, when Paul and Joy uh, uh, and I used to go to these, you know, U.S., expert meetings, the thing that drove us crazy is they'd say, well, you know, there's one opinion and another opinion and you got to find the middle ground. They used to drive us crazy, right? Because look, the middle ground between idiotic and science-based is not what you're going for, right? <laughs> you, know, you know, because that's what we've got. We've got idiotic versus science-based. And so, oh, you got to find a middle ground. We just couldn't stand that, right? And so this is why there was such clarity in saying, let's start from saying, what does this mean for the poorest people who are struggling the most and who, uh, uh, who deserve as much as maybe more than the rest of us access to healthcare, access to education, food, diapers, all the things that they need? Well, you know, what you end up having is a functioning public health system that does contact tracing, that does testing, that supports you in, in isolation and, uh, you know, stops what has been essentially not herd immunity, but herd culling. We've been culling the herd and we know exactly who's getting culled. And uh, we've just never, we, we've never um, been honest about it. And so I think that, you know, that there was courage here too, because every other uh, state and governor and secretary of health, and we talked to a lot of them, you know, Joya more than any of us, we talked to a lot of them and they kept saying, yes, we think you're right, but we just don't think we can do it. This is the richest country in the world, right? And so but, there's a reason why there's only one state that has done it fully and now has a system that can scale up, scale down. There's, there's a reason for that. And it's because the others backed off because they were scared. I, I, I just, it, it, you know, it, 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 um, it, it continues to shock me because we all thought surely this would never happen. And we said it. Well, gosh, if this was happening here, we would we would be pulling out all the stops. But it turns out that wasn't true. But you know, it it, it uh, the manner in which it's happening here is important as well. And I know everybody on this call agrees. So just as choosing between science and idiocy doesn't is not where we want to end up. Now we're having a a really silly debate about choosing between prevention and care. And we've already been through this debate many, many times with HIV, with drug resistant tuberculosis, with, you know, cholera. with cholera. I mean, you, you know, prevention and care with breast cancer. I mean, if we knew how to prevent it, that would be great. Right. But whether it's cholera, which we know how to prevent or breast cancer, which we're not entirely clear, uh, the choosing between prevention ca and care is as idiotic as choosing between idiocy and science. And what we're seeing now, I think, is it was always unlikely that in the United States you'd have clinical nihilism where we'd say, look, you know, these people are just not worth treating. Now, mind you, we do that anyway. We say essential workers, you know, they'll be fine. But the idea of calling for no treatment because someone's from Brooklyn rather than Manhattan it's not going to happen out loud, out loud. It will be hinted at, right? Sorry, but it's not going to happen. What we do have, and I'll stop here and, and mute, what we do <laughs> What do we have, Paul? A Rockefeller is what we have. Peter, what we have is containment nihilism. Rocky, <laughs> hush. What we have is containment nihilism. People saying, ah, it's, you know, the governor of Massachusetts said to me and Joya after having talked to Jim, I am so freaking tired of people saying it's too late to do contact tracing. So that's containment nihilism. Uh, clinical nihilism saying, oh, people from you know Brooklyn are not worth being treated. It's very hard to do. It's been done before for a couple hundred years in the United States, you know, poor people, brown people, black people. Um, you know, we can't be bothered. It's very hard to say that now. And uh, you know, but, another uh, another idiotic sorry. idiotic um, uh, quote unquote trade off is economy versus public health. Right? Yeah. And, and so I, I have been I've been calling everybody, all the business leaders, saying, 
you guys, don't you understand? There's no return to economic activity without tackling the public health problem. This is not a financial economic problem. Oh yeah, but you know, the lockdown are hurting everybody. Well, it's because the problem is that we only have lockdown. If you had a brief lockdown with masks and contact tracing and testing, you know, you could look like what's happening in a lot of other countries where they have brief lockdowns, they, they put out outbreaks, and then they have such a good system of testing, contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, that economic activity is almost fully back to normal, right? And yeah. so China is, uh, is fully back to normal. They had a, a crazy holiday season where people were packed on the Great Wall and there's a hundred cases and, not, and, and none of them are related to any of the, the activity. They've got it under control, right? So, so <laughs> what, what's the response to that? Well, that, those Chinese, they're doing this and they're doing that. And you know, the, 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 the heathen Chinese, it, it, the, the, that idea is back. But you know, um, it's not just China, it's Korea, it's Taiwan, it's New Zealand. But Jim, but Jim this, is why, this is why this relates so well to UGHE. I mean, the, the whole point of UGHE is that it addresses the whole system. And um, the fact that this, uh, this university was conceived um, and the idea of it, even before it became um, a university, even, even while it was an idea, um, before it was built, which is important because it's part of the aspirational piece of this, we were teaching um, under a tree or in Kigali before the, before, because the, the whole idea is what we're, you're all talking about, we're all talking about pushing forward being aspirational, changing the bar. We didn't think, I don't think at this point that we would be, have to push so hard in the United States to raise the bar to be able to, uh, to get a pandemic under control. And, and the fact that Rwanda has shown us how to do it in some ways, uh, Sierra Leone has shown us how to do it, Haiti has shown us how to do it because they have actually invested in public health. I mean, I, I actually, you know, the, whether or not, uh, uh, you know, thinking about how we start these kinds of things. And Peter, you know this because you were executive director of IMB in Rwanda before we had an oncology program. And what you decided to do with our great partners at the, in the government is to hire a part-time oncology nurse. Then you have an oncology program. You can start doing these things and insisting on talking to them and still realize that this is part of bending that arc, insisting that you have all of these components. And this university has just that, will insist on that. I remember a, um, a long, long time ago when Paul was in medical school and I used to go to classes with him. Um, and there was a, a class on, uh, they brought in a transplant patient um, and then uh, the transplant physician came in with him on, on stage and then they gave his story and then Paul uh, was sitting there and they, they asked the medical students whether they had any questions. And Paul said, after the patient left, I think, he said, yeah, who will these, who will these transplants be available for, to? Who will have these? Who will be open? Who will, who will be allowed to have these? And the, uh, the, the professors at the front were very taken aback because they thought that this highly specialized treatment that they would be getting you know, kudos for. And instead there was this idea of, yeah, but if you're gonna do them only for those people who can, who can pay or only a handful of people. And I think that's why UGH is a rebuke to all of this. It says the whole system and we must have the highest aspirational um, qualities that we can for, the, for all of it. You know, I can say so also aspect. that right, this right. is also the why this film is absolutely needed today. And it will be needed tomorrow because today it's COVID. Tomorrow we don't what, know what it will be, but it will be always the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized that are the, the, the system are ready to left out and the system that will work are only the system that are inclusive and are based on science and make it for all. And if you have a framework of equity, which is what is different about this, it has equity in the title, um, you, you know that you're not going to go wrong. And, you know, it has equity in the student body. It has equity in who it's going to reach. It has equity in, you know, pulling people from different countries. 13 different countries have been the students there. This, you know, this that started as an idea has, has um, really 
exploded out and, and will do. And that's the future of this. Mm. So yeah, I, I and, and all the leaders that are taught there are taught all this and how yes. to do this and how to advocate to make it happen, how to do what Joya and Jim is doing today with their governor uh, to make the change happen and to believe in it and to be yeah. really uh, the, the agent of change that the world needs. So this I, is what JG is. Yeah, can I just add about teaching? I think that part of any kind of nihilism, you know, any kind of we can't do this, but we can do this is how we're taught. I mean, if you go to a school of public health, a medical school, a business school, that the first thing they start talking about is trade-offs. But unwritten in the trade-offs is who it is that gets traded off. And so when you start with equity and the principle that the most vulnerable, right, the, the most marginalized historically and present day ought to be first in line, then everything changes. And so rather than starting with the principle of a trade-off, we start with the principle of equity and that changes the entire dynamic of what you can and cannot talk about. And, you know, I, I've seen so much of this, you know, we see it all the time, even at the med school, um, but certainly in the school of public health, certainly in business schools, it's like, well, you know, part of being strategic is to say what you're not gonna do. Well, who are we to say what's not gonna be done for somebody else's family? And I, and I think that is just infuriating to me. Mm. Yeah, can I just do uh, one quick thing and then Paul's gonna say something. So if you were to say, you know, let's say it's, um, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, October of 2019 and someone were to say, there's gonna be a coronavirus outbreak and it's gonna look like this, this, and this is what's gonna happen. And they asked me, which, which institution would you bet on getting the response right, UGHE or Harvard? I would have bet every penny on UGHE. Right? Hmm. Because what we know, what we know is that you've gotta be focused on what's this gonna do for the poorest. Exactly. You've gotta care that a disproportionate number of the deaths are in the African-American community, in the Native American community, in the, in the, uh, the Latinx community. You know, you've got to care about that. And then you've got to be humble in the face of science, right? Harvard uh, thinks they create science, right? I mean, we were having arguments where people were basically saying, you know, I've done some really great research and I think we should proceed in a way that tests my research ideas. That's essentially what they were saying, right? And now we have, you know, Bolsonaro repeating, you know, the Bolsonaros of the world got great strength from all this talk on herd immunity, right? Mm -hmm. And Tony's never, I mean, Tony Fauci's always said, herd immunity is not a strategy. It's an outcome if we're lucky. That's what, that, that's the right answer, but this is the stuff that we've been hearing. And so, you know, um, uh, institutions that don't focus on humility in the face of science, don't focus on the poor, don't focus on inclusion, they're gonna get it wrong and they're gonna get it wrong over and over and over again. Hmm. Sorry, Bell. Thank you, Jim. Paul, you've been patient. Yeah, but I mean, I think the things that I was going to say have been said. And just so just choosing a different way to say them, as, as Agnes said, it will happen again and again. It may be COVID today. It'll be something else next time. And uh, just to pick up on Jim's point and Joya's, and really Ophelia's point as well, is is there a way to use this notion of equity, a stand in for fairness and justice as a guardrail against having an institution that just is not able to do this work over the decades and centuries that are required? And I think, well, you know better than anyone, Peter, because you were involved from the get-go and also in what, what you did, Peter, was to try and just as Corey did with the film, you, went, you sifted through this enormous amount of material that we were generating as we you know, came up with the plan and said, what are the things that would protect us from doing the wrong thing or make sure that we did the right thing? And you know, elevating equity was really the best idea that we had, right? I mean, preferential options for the poor is very specific, but often, you know, and we've seen this, and I have no reason to believe that there's another idea that's better than preferential option for the poor in difficult circumstances. But sometimes our colleagues in Navajo, for example, would say, we don't like to be called the poor. 
And, you know, we didn't waste our time saying, yeah, but there are poor Navajo inside the reservation. We didn't need to say anything. We could just say, yeah, noted, right? And so this idea of putting equity in the name of the university uh, was really as much as anything to try and prevent us from adding up to less than the sum of our parts mm. from, you know, being mediocre, really. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just am echoing what my colleagues and friends are saying, that if we keep global health equity front and center, you know, as defined, and again, Jim and I heard the term global health equity because a friend of ours who was head of the, the CDC for a while involved in smallpox eradication, a guy named Bill Fagey, uh, wrote uh, about global health equity 20 years ago and said, hey, you know, this is the shortest little list of terms we could come up with, global health equity. And that's kind of where we, we, um, we stayed. Jim, I don't know if I, you know, paraphrase that well, but that was an idea that we took from somewhere else also. Thank you. And yes, I wonder if we can turn to you uh, just in our last couple of minutes. So the, you know, the, the film traces decades of work and it sort of ends at the time that UGHE begins, right? It's sort of in the closing credits that um, the, the sort of next step was to, to build this university and to, you know, we welcomed our first cohort of students on the anniversary of the Alma Ata Declaration of Health for All. Uh, what's clear about the film is that it's the work of, you know, of generations and Paul mentioned centuries. Paul, you planted redwood trees um, on the campus of Butara Hospital in, in Rwanda. So you know, what comes next? What's our charge for the university? And how is, how is UGHE having a role to kind of write the next chapter in this story? Uh, the next chapter will be huge, but never enough because we have so much to do all together. Uh, but uh, we have started to create, uh, to diversify what we are teaching inside Rwanda, but also open a satellite campus outside Rwanda because we cannot absorb the demand for a, this type of education, the demand for uh, this type of know-how and vision and philosophy in what health is, what equity is, how can we I do that? So the first place will be IT and we will grow together uh, uh, because uh, we are here uh, we are six, five, and that, by the way, we are going to partner also with Oxford. Oxford we, uh, has to be ready to do that also with all the global good people around the world who want improvement of the health of all, and especially the most vulnerable among ourselves. So there is a lot to do, uh, and we will do our best to, res to improve access for all by growing with JG. Mm. Thank you, Agnes. We're going to have to wrap it up now as we come to the top of the hour. I wish we had another hour or more. It's so great to get all of you together. And uh, uh, it, it, it's great to see um, to, to, to see all this passion. And I hope that if we get a new administration um, in the United States, they know who to call um, very soon. Um, to all of you out there, thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your support and your partnership. So many of you are part of this work. Um, spread the word uh, uh, about the film and, um, you know, and join us in the, in the next phase of this work. Um, I love you guys. They can hear me. Uh, Ophelia, Jim, Agnes, Joya, Paul. <laughs> This is Anele. Anele. Thank, you so much, Anele. Thank you so much for your work. And see you all soon. Thanks all for joining. <laughs>